Hey, we're live. We haven't talked about Mother of Learning for a little while, but I'm here with Bradley to catch it's what, up. It's what people have been clamoring for. <laughs> it's what the people want. I'm sure uh, there's one people out there somewhere who wants there's to. There's gotta it. there's gotta be one of them. Hello, person. Hello, person. We appreciate you listening, but more importantly than you is the fact that I want to know what Bradley thinks about uh, book two of Mother of Learning, because um. At the recording of this, book three did come out a month or two ago. Um, we've both started a little bit on that, but we didn't want to get too ahead of ourselves. Yeah, I think the gap between them releasing book two and book three was pretty much non-existent. Like, I think they released book two and then book three immediately after, whereas I think between book one and book two, it was pretty short, but there was still a little bit of a wait. We got um, lucky that um, as we finished the audiobook for one the audiobook for two came out i i have no idea when two and three what the gap was but all i know is i finished it i looked over and it was there so i know like might as well keep going and you know what like being the middle arc of the story is always weird because like arc one i don't know you get all the exposition and stuff so that's cool and it's like no matter what downsides arc one would have i don't know you you get the cool you get the cool elements of like being introduced to the time loop and stuff like that and then you know obviously neither of us have finished arc three but i don't know you get the conclusion to the story the middle arc is like the middle sibling where it's like i don't know you don't get the spotlight of being the exposition or the finale so mm. it's like how do you how do you make the middle part stand out question is is it going to be three or five actually i don't know i just assumed it would be three I, th I have no idea how many there are. I think when we started this, I, I, you said it was five because it's like 120 and they do about 25 to 28 per. That's the thing. You know, I was wondering that because I, I do believe there's like about 100 chapters. And I don't know. They've been doing what, like 20 per arc? Quote yeah, unquote? I think the last one was, I, I know the first one for sure was like 25, 26. And I think the last one was maybe slightly more by like one or two. So which, I could be tripping. I think they're still on track for uh, for three or four, which means we're now entering the middle. This is a more awkward, like, pre-middle-middle, because it, it did feel like a big transitionary arc. Um, a main question I wanted to ask you, I mean, just to kind of frame our conversation from the get-go, how did you feel at, like, the beginning, middle, and end of this section? Like, did your... How did your thoughts kind of uh, weave in and out before we get into like specific plot points that we might want to talk about? You know, of the art of arc two, uh, I think the second half of this arc is a lot stronger than the first half, mm. mostly because at the very end of arc one, I like the finale of arc one for its faults that we talked about, as yeah. I, I think was actually pretty fucking cool. It's cool. It's a cool shakeup of the status quo, even though like. Um, there were some things we didn't like, or I, I thought it was like a predictable endpoint, but it was still like engaging to go through. Because like the whole soul kill thing, that was pretty badass. It ups yeah. the stakes. Um, so I think th the one place where I think Arc Two really fails is like the very, very first part because Zorian's caught in this whole mindset of like, okay, well, what do I do now? Because my only allies are gone, and he spends a few chapters just kind of roaming around the land meeting new people um and I, I honestly i think maybe the the one thing i just don't like about this is when he spends a really long time like what what's her name silver lake like trying yeah. to study under her and that's in the spider there, there's the town he goes to and keep in mind this was a while ago so i have is my notes to kind of guide me here but in the very beginning he goes to like a different town he stops going to school and starts going to a town and gets like a license to work as a young mage, and um, um a, along that arc he meets that Silver Lake lady, um, who still hasn't really contributed to the story. I don't like in a significant way, unless I'm forgetting something major. Uh, but then he also meets Alanis, I think is his name, which is like Kyle's teacher, I believe, uh, who becomes a much more important part of the story. Um, and that's the thing. The other teachers, we I think we get some payoffs from all of them whether it's the soul training or whether they get cool moments helping out fighting the invaders and stuff oh, like yeah. that. I think that's the only reason I didn't like Silver Lake in particular is because we, I don't, she appears at the beginning and then doesn't appear again. Yeah, like, not I'm really not wrong. We haven't cashed in on yet, her yet. She just keeps getting mentioned every once in a while. 
Um, Because I think her thing is like, go kill that big spider thing and then we'll talk, which when I stop the book, they're doing that (laughs) in part three. So we might get something with her soon. Um, That's the thing. I I want the spider to be a big payoff. But uh, uh, like Alanis also gets introduced around this part. And I think he was kind of like the saving grace of the section of the book that got a little stale. I'll also say that like if we split the thirds like the this book into thirds i would say the middle uh sections also kind of slow but the third section is maybe probably the best section of either book so far for me oh definitely like stuff that, was popping off because we're, we're finally cashing in on stuff and we reach yeah. the point where zorian has enough info that he's like all right i can i can actually the, probably fuck up these books there's the so much edging to this story that, like but, you know, I'm still intrigued. I'm, I'm ready to blow. And I've, I've, you know, there's been a couple of blows here and there, which is exciting. But um, Alanis in particular, I think, was interesting because uh, I thought the way he was introduced pretty early was kind of uh, memorable where I think a bunch of random mages pop up and attack them. And Alanis is very, like, kill happy in that scene, I think. And Zorian yeah. is kind of apprehensive about it, even though he says he's not. And Which is, I think is a, that's a through line of this section, I think, is the that change of mindset over time. Yeah, because whenever it starts out, Zorian actually gets, like, scolded for not being, you know, deadly enough. Yeah. He, like, why the fuck aren't you using more lethal spells? These guys are trying to kill you. Um, and then as we go through this part, we see Zorian like slowly trickle more and more into stuff that we don't think he would have normally done. Like for example, taking out entire Aranean settlements and probing their minds, even when he's being begged not to. Yeah, we could, uh, I mean, we could unpack that right now if we want to, as like a major theme of this part. Like it starts with him, like he does that. And like, even when, uh, Zach joins him a little later, it, it's like uncomfortable for him even. And, um, he also starts like, probing innocent people people that are just tangentially related to the big conspiracy around the invasion and around Sudamir's lab like the way he gets information out of people makes you kind of scratch your head a little bit or be like oof like i thought you were you said you weren't going to do these kinds of things zorian but over time and without him even really acknowledging how far he's come he's pushed that needle like he's pushed that line forward and forward and forward and it it's been it's been one of the most interesting slow burns of the book is in pushing those boundaries. Yeah, and man, what makes it interesting is like it's always there for him to do. The thing yeah. with his mind magic is kind of like unlike his other magic, it's not structured like I don't know. He he has to actively turn it off if he doesn't want to use it on people and it's just so easy that in everyday situations or even against enemies at any time he could just mind magic them to either break them or learn what they're thinking learn their secrets learn how they're feeling um and so against like people he actually likes he has to be like okay i'm just gonna make sure i'm just doing surface surface level empathy right now yeah and uh yeah it's just interesting to see how that mind magic has grown as well like it's it's so effortless for him to do now where like ah. I, I, I actually forget when this book ends, how much he interacts with Zack. It's not that much, right? Because I, I, I think I'm getting some of that mixed with book three stuff. Because as I recall, Zack shows up and then they talk in the tunnels and then it's not that long until they go visit the snake, right? Or am I wrong? I, th- I believe book two ends with them finding like the control center. Yeah, which the they league. got from the snake. I think that includes them doing the Aranea uh, subquest. So. so yeah, like, it's it becomes a big defining feature between the two where it's like, Zack is really good at his own things, but that mind magic is a gap between them that he has really nothing to overcome and it's or, or like, yeah, to defend himself with. And it's just, aside from like a basic mental spell he can do, mental barrier... Um, and it's just kind of like a trust thing between them initially, which I think is really interesting. Man, and we got to talk about Zach and Zorian and trust and stuff because oh, yeah. it's... I think we I think we're both in agreement that Zach makes the story a million times better. Zach was uh, the missing ingredient. I like the story was enjoyable, but I, I kept thinking it's like we haven't 
gone anywhere necessarily. We're still like very much learning and, and training and evolving. But Zack was that missing spice where it's like, oh, now we have a true equal for Zorian to bounce it, like against. And that equal is personality completely like diametric to Zorian. It's perfect. Yeah, the way I described him is that he is like the perfect shonen boy counterpart to Zorian. Yeah, who's what's like, real Zorian's kind of like the rival character, but he's a protect. Like, yeah, personality wise, I mean. What's really interesting is that for for as many times as Zach has looked at something Zorian can do and gone like, "Oh my god, my loops would have gone so much easier if I could do that." Yeah. I think there's also about as many moments where Zorian's like, you're telling me this whole time this would have been this easy if I just had Zack tag along with me? So many, why didn't I think of that? Like, <laughs> it so it, it's, Zorian. it's good how they balance each other out like that. And also, what you were saying about the personality stuff is so great because when they learned about the true nature of the time loop, oh. Z like, Zorian is just racking his brain and he's like, this sucks if I tell zach how the time loop really works like he's not gonna trust me anymore we might be at each other's throats and zorian does not give someone trust until it is beyond a reasonable doubt that they cannot like stab him in the back and and you know like them highlighting that appeases my complaints in the first section about like man i just wanted to tell zach already they're dragging this out so long but i think it smoothed out as like we get to see what actually happens after he does yeah. It shows how different they are because Zorian's warning him all this stuff. Like, if I tell you how the time loop works, we're not going to trust each other, blah, blah, blah. And then he finally tells Zack, and Zack's like, oh, well, then we just won't leave until we find a way to get both of us out. Like, it's that easy. And I think even Zorian pauses after he says that, and he's like, damn, Zack's kind of inspiring sometimes. Yeah, oh, man. Like, I think Zack's my favorite line. character. <laughs> Uh, when you when you say it like that, like Zach is also my favorite character. I think he adds so much to the story, yeah. and like that's why part three has been like actually pretty juicy so far. Yeah, Zorian's just like, how the fuck can you be so trusting? But I, I think the longer he travels with Zach, the more he sees how beneficial it is to not treat everyone like they're out to get you. And, and you know, like talking about it again with you it makes me appreciate the slow burn a little more than I might have like if I just read the book and didn't like have anyone to bounce discussions with yeah it's like it's it's really rewarding when the plot is it starts moving forward because there's been so much setup like the slow burn is kind of working for its favor right now as opposed to being uh, a negative man and talk about another character-based payoff we've been waiting for oh man we've been waiting for Z zvim yeah. this entire time and i'm pretty satisfied with how he's turned to know Oh, yeah. Zvim has been great. Um, I, I love the review of, like, oh, dude, I was going to stop being a hard-ass, like, two months in. <laughs> I do this with everyone. Dude, Zoria got so pissed. And, like, that's the, from the beginning of the story, I've always had the feeling, like, if Zorian could somehow get past his bullshit, I bet Zim, Zvim is, like, one of the most powerful and helpful motherfuckers in the story. But, yeah, and, oh, my God. And I love, like... The verification processes Vin goes through, like, he has his ways of verifying that what Zorian is saying is true. And he still takes his time with it, but he's, it's not, he's not annoying about it. This could have easily been like a, it took multiple loops for me to figure out how to convince him. But not really. Like, it only took one or two before he got it down how to convince him. And I think that's yeah. like... The, it's it's good pacing wise. Same with Alanis. I think Alanis came around at the right amount of time. Yeah, you gotta figure it out. Um, speaking of people who know about the time loop now, I also like when Zorian tells... Is it Tyvern or Tyburn? Oh, it's uh, Tyven. I think Tyven. they spell it T-A-I-V-E-N. And that I wanted to bring that one up, too. That was one of my favorite just Zorian interacting with a person moments. Mm -hmm. It's uh, It was nice because... <laughs> like, she has to consider that she's gonna forget all of this and like is she even gonna be herself after the loop as we find out at the end the answer is no and we'll save that whole thing for later um it just feels like such a human moment and she feels like i, I forget exactly how it goes but she feels almost like a, a little frustrated that's like i've been thinking you got so much stronger and i've been having so much self-doubt but i now i know that you were like cheating and i also know that you're not cheating as much as you can like, the, the thought process there where she's like, this explains why you're so ahead of me, 
but also like why aren't you utilizing these techniques to get even further ahead um i thought all that's, that was interesting that's the thing in this universe i feel like almost every fe field of magic has that I, I mean there's a long running theme of the book that oh repetition is the mother of learning yeah. and like every field of magic just just takes practice and practice and practice and practice and god she was just fucking devastated when he suddenly got stronger than her because she's like I've been practicing like literally since I was a little baby and you're stronger than me. What does that say about me? Yeah, that, that was a really good scene. Speaking of that, so before her, was Kyle the only person who knew about the time loop? And the RNA, of course. I think so, right? That, that might have been it. We got a, we have a lot more of him bringing people into the fray this time good, around. Right, like, it, it'd be, it, like, because it's such a slow burn and, and uh, Zorian's such a head up his ass kind of guy, um... <laughs> It, it, you, you start to worry around book one if it's like, are we going to, like, drag this out to part five until people know? But thankfully, that's been alleviated a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, how do you feel about him and other classmates in this section? Because I think we also made some progress in so, sort of those plot lines. Uh, other classmates in general? I, I just find it really interesting. And this goes back to Tyven, but also Zorian in general. I think he's now... He's now more aware of how he's changed during the time loop. Because I, I don't know if he was as aware of his personality changes in arc one. Yeah. But even Tyven, whenever he's consoling her about, you know, his new combat abilities, she's like, why, like, why are you being so nice? And he's like, why the fuck would I not be nice? And she's like, you're just not acting like yourself. He doesn't even understand his progress, which has become interesting over time. Because now that he's making real progress, it's... It's even more interesting when he realizes he made that progress. It's and great. I think there's there's even interactions with his classmates, like Akoya and stuff, where I don't know, they might ask him a question and he'll think to himself, you know what? Before the time loop I would have said, said no. This, yeah. But fuck it. Um, I like the little group he makes with the golem boy and the two battling trainers, I think. Um, yeah, you know, I wish that would have maybe. I, I kind of wish I would have. Uh, we would have got more out of that because I was actually really having fun with his little combat club. It'll come back, of course. It, the story of is course. interesting because it's like we're gonna have these extremely longed out plot threads, such as the Aranea's uh, memory packet, but we're going to layer so many of them where it's like uh, this will come up now and then it'll come up a little later, and we'll just keep kind of ping ponging between seven different threads and slowly make progress. That's the um, thing. In the very first chapter, he, like, casually mentions a girl crying in the park near a fountain or something. Yeah. And then, you know, like, 50 chapters later, oh, that's his little sister's best friend, and it turns out she's being sacrificed for the Which, ritual. Hey, okay, let's talk about her a little bit, because we, we got kind of her home life in this one, right? So, uh, before that, actually, the other classmate I think worth mentioning is the, um, the cat shifter girl yes i i just kind of like his interactions with her and i kind of i just kind of like zorian talking to girls in general because it's like, oh dude anytime zorian's cute. talking to a girl it's hilarious because he doesn't realize how much pull he has yeah he doesn't realize he's a harem protagonist now in, in a little time in a little isekai where he's in his, his own alternate world now but um there's that's a different girl than the girl who whose family is known to be like drug magicians where they uh smuggle stuff right yeah um, she comes from like the borderline mafia family i i also like when she shows up to the house and is like dealing with him and, uh, and kyle and like talking about preconceived notions that zoria might have for her and all that dude that's the thing we eventually reach a point where amaya's house is full of like <laughs> yeah. like it's like 20 characters in there and it, like he he it, shows up because he wasn't even there, but all of these characters he's met throughout the story are there. And he shows up, and it's like, oh, that girl accidentally got some of the drugs from his classmate that Kyle yeah, was trying to buy. that was a weird section. And he, he shows up, and he has to deal with the situation, he's like, Jesus fucking Christ, I know too, I know too many people. And then starts showing up, and it's like, oh, God. <laughs> like, I know, if I was Amaya, I'd be like, this motherfucker fuck? brought too many people to my house. <laughs> um. So about uh the little girl, right? So she's she's got a mom... Who's who's weary of like cat shifters or whatever is kind of sus of Zorian. I do. You, do you have any thoughts on that or what to make of the mom? So I can't remember. Was the mom also a cat shifter or is she just like trying to protect her daughter? I think she was trying to protect her daughter from cat shifters, but maybe there was an implication that she is one. 
because I think shifters in general have a bad reputation, but I think they said specifically cat shifters have the worst yeah. reputation because they're like, oh, people are only ever cat shifters if they want to break into places and be burglars. Like, all right. This is like very weird, uh, like, cat shifter racism. What about the dad? Dads in this story are super sus because we'll talk about Zorian's dad in a second. But, like, her dad is also just shows up in the story. It's like, well, he's not in the picture. Like, he, he, he lives there, but we never see him, and I don't think we get an answer of what he does, right? Yeah, and you know, I think that relates back to one theme of the story that we're going to have to cash in on before it finishes is, I, I don't think it's just Zorian. I think maybe multiple people in the story have strained relationships with either their parents or caretakers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Zach, I don't know. I, I wanna, well. Yeah, so I want to see where the story goes with that, because... God, like, Zorian has to see his older brother at some point in the story, right? Since, there, since like, I am one, like, it's been I like... am, like, 99% convinced that his older brother was the last person to do the, the time loop. Ooh, because, you know, like, how else would he be such a fucking prodigy? He's such a Chad, and, like, I think it might have gone either a shorter span of time for him, or he broke out faster, but I think he did it intentionally, and, okay... So, either Actually, the little girl's dad or Zorian's dad is the start of the time loop. That is my running theory right now. Damn. And he sent his son through the system, and look how well he turned out. And his good-for-nothing Zorian got dragged in. But I think he does it through Red Robe. So, like, he, he or, or he is Red Robe, but I think he does it through Red Robe, where um, he purchases these services from a third party, and then they will grab... Uh, like say a Zach and then also put a marker on the sun so he can go through the training and they come out as better people. And you know, I hadn't thought of this before you brought up that theory just now that Zorian's brother had done the time loop before. I think they specifically said Zorian's brother's expertise is like archaeology, which there's so many magical artifacts that Zorian's chasing down, like the True. keys, the keys are artifacts. Bakura gates are artifacts. Even the fucking time loop mechanism could probably be considered an artifact. What's the deal with the keys again? They're just artifacts that pop you out. Yeah. So like, I believe if you get the keys, that's a way to like override like any restrictions on the mechanism. Mm, right. Right. So which would let them get out. Um, or if you have the keys, like maybe you get like admin access or something. Something like that. The, Mag which, the literal MacGuffins. Which, like, come on. The the mecha the time loop itself is way cooler than I thought it was at the start of the story. Oh, oh, if, if we want to unpack that, absolutely. I think it's really cool. And bleak. Like, once you get there, and you can really see it through Sven and Alanis, but I hope we get to see it through multiple characters, that realization that they are not human. How is that going to play when it's, when it's endgame time? And the reality of the end of their existence is kind of coming into play, you know? Like, that's going to be interesting, hopefully. Because, man, my stomach dropped because even if they figure all this out, they figure out how to leave the time loop and stop Red Rope, even if they figure all that out, which is already an impossible task, if they want to leave the loop, it's implied they're going to have to kill their real-world counterpart. That is, like... This story does a lot of, like, we're going to bring up this now and kind of dance around it, but Zorian's going to bring it up as a possibility, and then it becomes certified later. I feel like that's going to be one of those things. And, uh, oof. Like, what? I, like, oof. I, that reveal, the story was, like, reaching a point where it was, like, dipping down into, like, yeah, this is, this is fine. I enjoy listening to it, but, like, I think there's so much potential from the reality of the time loop and the fact that red robe has left a while ago um god th this could go so many cool places and i'm like fingers crossed that this is a slow burn into a very good finale that really goes deep into some of the implications that we kind of get from the end of this part dude that was that was such a really cool reveal at the end because you know, it, it's been years since the Aranean Soul Kill, and Zorian's been, like, losing his fucking mind. He's like, I gotta keep a low profile, because I don't even know where Red Robe is. Yeah. Is he gonna track me down? Is he gonna get me? Is he trying some other method besides the invasion to accomplish his goals? And then it's like, oh my fucking god, he's been gone for years. I could have done whatever I wanted. It's the, the sinking feeling of when you realize, like, 
now that we know there's a direct end to the time loop, which one I think when we learn of it is four years, right? Or something like that. Yeah, I think they have like they have like fifty something weeks. It, I think it really makes you think of the time spent, and like it, you kind of feel queasy about it because like oh, Zoria spent like a, a month or two doing this random bullshit. <laughs> like he he got library access for like it took him forever, and he only like, has four four years left. It's the it's the perfect nauseating amount of time left because it's just long enough that it's like okay no we have time to make a plan but it's also short enough that it's way shorter than the time they've already spent in the loop and they're like ah oh, fuck we're not nearly where we need to be and uh, I I like how they found a way to cheat that system in book three if you've gotten there um, as... I can't remember how many chap oh I can't remember how many chapters I am in. Oh, you. Uh, you'll be, you'll get there soon because you weren't that far, far behind me. Uh, so we talk about Zorian's dad, uh, Zorian's training method. Let's talk about Zorian and Kirill. What do you, what are your thoughts on this, on this uh, plot thread in this section? Man, I love them. I think even one of the first times that Zorian starts the loop off by teaming up with Zack. Obviously the very first time Kirill attacks Zack, and <laughs> that's funny, but I, I think one of the other times Zack asks Zorian, like, why are you taking Kirill with you? And I, I think he even says as much, like, we're way closer than we were before the time loop. Yeah, I, he even he's keen to it. I love him uh, porting over her drawings. I love him taking interest in that hobby of hers. He's just so yeah. much sweeter to her now. He, he, like, he's actually started drawing now, I think, at this point, just occasionally, because he's like, man, I love reading, but there's only so many books in the world, man. <laughs> and <laughs> he, he ends up starting to draw, and he's like, okay, this is relaxing. It's it's great. Um, man, so... Uh... I, I want like what what were some of the negatives for this part aside from maybe stuff that you've mentioned? I, I could start with like some repetitiveness where there are stretches of like two or three chapters where we're kind of doing the less interesting training stuff, and it, of course it's it's a slow burn setup for him learning a skill or, or hanging out with a character more. But there are times where it's like we haven't made much progress, and it did um, weigh on me a couple portions of this uh, of this arc. Yeah, one thing I like about how the story is usually structured, and I think they kind of did this in arc one and arc two to varying degrees, is there's a pattern of like, okay, this is going to be an important loop. We're going to yeah. spend two or three chapters on this loop, and then after that one, the next chapter could span like ten loops all at once of Zorian just trying stuff and training. Um, so I, I really like that. However, a lot of this book, aside from the Silver Lake stuff at the very beginning we talked about, so much of this book is visiting different Aranean webs and settlements. And uh, yeah. I don't like, you know, he might have to visit four different webs that all turn him down before he finds one that says yes. And I'm like, I feel like we probably could have streamlined the searching for teachers uh, process a little bit. That and also the um, searching for um, Pseudomir's lab kind of thing and like yes. tracking down the merchants who were tangentially related. That was also, like, another portion that kind of grinded to a halt a little bit. Yeah, because you know what? I think he tries to infiltrate Sudamir's mansion about three times. And while he does eventually get to a point that he can quote-unquote defeat Sudamir, I, I, don't, I don't feel like we get really get the big payoff. Like, he doesn't feel, like, permanently defeated or anything. Obviously, he can't be because of the time loop. But Yeah, it's a weird aspect his, to the story. For as many times as... For as many times as we invaded that mansion, I don't feel like he got anything, any permanent benefit out of it, I guess. Like, he knows about the big tube that sucks up souls, but we don't really know for what reason. Like, that is a side plot to the summoning of the, like, giant immortal thing, right? Like, that is just like, we're going to summon that, and then because it's going to kill a bunch of people, I'm going to suck up all these souls to, I think, revive my wife or something like that? Here's Here's... My other main complaint, there was portions where there was just so much exposition. It kind of happens when he talks to his cat shifter uh, classmate. It happens when he talks to his drug dealer classmate. And it the worst offender is it happens when they catch Sudamir, who is ostensibly the main antagonist of Arc 2. They yeah. catch him, and then you just go into this, like, and then Sudamir told us this, and it's like a long-ass section of just 
exposition of what Sudamir told them and the explanations for his motivations. I was like, for the main antagonist of this, having another exposition help right now really actually hurts that that whole plot thread, in my opinion. And I think that was our biggest gripe of Mark 1, 2, is exposition dumps. Yeah. Because um, that's, like, it's clear there's a bunch of different like countries and family lineages and powers and fields of magic in this, but I feel like we need a more organic way to tell us about those things. Yeah, they do come off pretty inorganically, and it, it and I don't, I can't say necessarily that it got better this part. It, it felt about the same if I had to yeah. think back on it. it. It feels like we'll visit a new town or we'll meet a new bad guy, and then I don't know, like I don't know, they'll tell us what the name of that town or they'll tell us what town the bad guy is from, and then. It's almost like the author went like, ah, shit, I didn't tell them about the history of this country yet. Yeah, and it's. I wonder if it's a unescapable issue with the time loop format, because say you get to a uh, other story arc, like a One Piece arc, or like a, any, any like arc-based story, right? You hit this point, you get the exposition, but the exposition's directly going to feed into the end of the arc, like you... You get to it, and then you get the resolution. But because the story is like, you get to the exposition, then I'm going to do actually ten different things until we cap off on that exposition. It makes it so it's like hard to care at the moment when you know that Zorian's going to do dozens of little side tasks until he addresses what he just learned. That's the thing. If I get exposition, I want it to be used later, and I want that later to be relatively soon. Yeah, it's... It's just like it might be a a side effect of having that much um, jumping around uh, on the side quests. He, he he's like playing a video game where he's just doing each side quest a little bit by little bit and just consistently jumping around with some grinding here and there. Oh yeah, but uh, that like that exposition was my main gripe. Uh, what else we got? Because I think I have less gripes than I did with Arc 1. The gripes are mostly the same, which is like expedition dumps and some pacing. But other than that, I, th I feel like this is stronger. And I feel like we both feel like Arc 3 is the strongest so far of what we've read of it. Easily. For me, it's like Arc 2 had me the most annoyed at points where it's like, I it's hard to pay attention to those exposition dumps. And then you like lose uh, track a little bit in your audio booking. So you may miss a detail here and there. And then you're just like, I... I want to get to the next thing, so I'm tuning out a little bit. And they, hey, that's my bad. But also, like, it's just not engaging at the moment. So yeah. those moments hit a little harder for me, but the ending makes this arc overall better. I think it culminated something really cool. That's the thing. I, I feel like we had a very satisfying conclusion to this arc because the last arc had the really cool moments of, like, Zack and Zorian get to fight the invasion, even if Zack doesn't know... Zorian's yeah. a time looper yet. They get to fight the invasion. He gets to stand off with Red Robe. There's the super hype, super depressing soul kill stuff. But there was also stuff we didn't like about that finale, which, like, they spent half the chapter talking about primordials, which we didn't even see. Yeah. True. Uh, stuff like that. So this, this finale was awesome because it's like they had their Answers. triumphant moments, and then Zack and Zorian actually finally get together. And then also we learn about the nature of the time loop. So that was a badass finale. Yes. Um, about uh, Zor uh, we haven't talked about Zorian and Kyle a little bit. Uh, there's one little moment I did want to highlight that really shows how far Zorian's come, and it's the moment or like or the implications of telling someone about the time loop. It's when like Kyle asks him to not tell him about Sudamir next time. Yeah. Because he finds out about like Sudamir's killing children every loop, and you don't know how to stop him and I keep coming to you and you get to stress about it for a month. So he's like, ignorance is bliss here. And I do like how Zorian considers it. And it's like a silent consideration where he's like, I guess I see where this guy's coming from. It, it is hard for me to put this burden on someone who doesn't get to, uh, doesn't get to like retain that information to next loops and do something about it. Ultimately, he has to kind of suffer with being useless every loop as a result yeah if he gets that knowledge he's like oh well can't do anything i'll just be yeah. sad about it burden of knowledge and man you want to know what about with you know people learning they're in loops this was really cool about halfway through the arc zorian has his talk with tyvan where you know he tells her that she's in the loop and 
I think she also immediately is like, okay, so what's the fucking deal? Am I dying every single yeah. time? Like, what's going on? And Zorin explores a, different, a few different possibilities. Like, I don't know if you're, like, dying, dying, or if it's just rolling you back. Because even he didn't know the nature of the time loop at that point. But I think he tried to dissuade her fears, like... If you're not dead at the end of the loop already, it probably doesn't kill you, kill you. It might just roll the world back. And But then, you know, we find out at the end of this part when we learn the nature of the time loop, it's like, yeah, everybody in the time loop is pretty real. Um, they get created and they're like a real person that's separate from their real life person. And it feels like, yeah, maybe everyone does kind of die at the end of each loop. It, they kind of play it both ways where it's like, yeah. you're a copy of someone's soul. And I think the implication is like the soul piece will return to the normal person once the loop is over. I might have misunderstood that. Um, I think that's what it is. Like, if you if you, if you're outside of the time loop, you're in real life, and you use that I think it takes your soul into the time loop. I think for everybody else, it doesn't necessarily take their soul in. It just looks at their soul to and make a replica. Right. So yeah, this is, I, I mean, there's the whole discussion they have where it's like, well, the, the time loop makes it such that it would be breaking the rule to influence or for a non-marked person to get too much information about the time loop and deviate into its own person. Um, there's like a whole bunch of clone ethics that the time loop has programmed into itself, which was pretty interesting. I forget some of the specifics, but they do go over that. Oh well, yeah, because they have stuff like, you know, they don't want you taking clones out of the time loop or stuff like that, or having you, like, people deviate too far from what they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And what was really cool was hearing the, uh, we, we got to meet the ghost serpent thing. Yeah. And, and it, it fucking hated them as soon as oh, it realized yeah. they were users of the loop. Because you have to realize, like, the ghost serpent, it wouldn't have... It, it has no memories of ever looping. All it knows oh. is that there is a device somewhere that allows people to do this. And the fact that it hates them so much means previously it's encountered someone who used this looping device... And was able to fucking exploit this ghost serpent to the point where it's like, I, I don't know, it's probably so mad realizing that it's the version inside the loop whenever they come up to talk to it. Right, that knowledge, like, it knew it before anyone else. Um, and it's so cool because its dialogue is actually like, you know what, that's fair. I, I understand why you're being so mad about this because like, if I even give you an inch, I know that you'll take an inch from me in every iteration and get everything you need so you know what just i'm gonna be a complete hard ass i'm giving you nothing not even a little bit because i know you can exploit me in different ways and just crack away at me and get all the little information you need exactly like that that's kind of the only policy you can take to be immune to this stuff because if you give them even an inch each loop eventually they're gonna get what they want so it's like you know what only way to prevent you from getting what you want is to just refuse to communicate with you is the, uh, is the part where Zven shows up to the house and is like, hey, Zorian, you should maybe do crimes. Is that in this or next book? Oh, yeah, it's in part two, which was really interesting because we even talked earlier about the morals and, man, yeah, Zim's like, Zvim's like, Zorian, you're really not using your mind magic enough. Like, you have an amazing opportunity here to go around just... Stealing like, shit, yeah. Like, like, destroying people and getting all kinds of magical secrets and Zorian... I think even to him says, like, I don't know if I want to be that kind of person. And I, as I recall, Alanis was not okay with Vin's plan there as well. Oh, which is yeah, he was Interesting, because in the start of the story, Alanis is all, you know, Zorian, if you're doing self-defense, you should probably be more lethal and kill a hoe, right? Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, now that we get this, it's more like, you know, Zorian, if you do this, I'm worried about how it, what kind of person it's going to make you in the long term, because, like, I, I think he views a difference b between self-defense and warping, uh, like becoming the kind of person who's willing to do unspeakable harm to innocence just yeah. to just because you know it'll loop. His line is somewhere between there. Yeah, and I, and I think that's interesting. It makes Alanis a little more nuanced. With like, yeah, yeah. because I, I, I expected him to be like, "Yeah, Zorian, fuck them up," but it, it was interesting that he was against that. Here's one other thing, since you mentioned Zvim again, that I'm really liking, we're finally got, starting to get some payoff on. 
near the beginning of the story, they talk about structured magic and unstructured magic and the benefits of each. And here's the thing. Almost everybody uses structured magic all the time because it's like, oh, you know, it's easier to learn. It's easier to execute, stuff like that. And I remember them saying, the thing with unstructured magic is it doesn't necessarily have the same limitations. It was either Z Zorian or Zvim himself who said, theoretically, there's no limit to what you can do with unstructured magic. People just don't use it because it's that fucking hard. Yeah, but, but then, you, like, don't, really... you don't have that limitation realistically. That's the thing. You just ha like you have to practice so much to get good with it that people don't do it. But that's what Zorian's been doing, and there's so many cool moments. Like for example, when Z Zorian is first trying to convince Zvim of the time loop, and he's showing off his mind magic abilities. You know, obviously he infiltrates Zvim's mind at first, and then Zvim's like, "Hold on, hold on, give me a second. <laughs> and then <laughs> he ends up repelling Zorian, and Zorian's like, "What the fuck?" And it turns out it was unstructured mind magic he did that he just learned on the fly. That's so badass. I also and like it, when he makes uh, it so Zorian can't even perceive his office. Uh, he, that was badass. Yeah, Zvim is great. And I don't know. I think we're getting other moments where unstructured magic is paying off, even if it's little moments, because. It's extremely early in Arc 3, so I wouldn't consider it a spoiler, but Zorian gets knocked over, and he doesn't have time to even cast a spell, so he's like, I just uh, I just unstructured magic my hand to the wall so I wouldn't fall. Sure. Um, and I'm like, I don't know, I want to see more of that. And, like, I don't expect him to become, like, a unstructured magic god where he oh, yeah. becomes just a Dragon Ball energy manipulator, but, like, because realistically he only has four years, but, well... You know what? With what I know from Arc Three, maybe I should expect that actually, because he, they find some creative ways to extend their time. And... Yeah, and there's there's also Zvim is like, oh, like if this is what you're doing, if you're really trying to get good, I think he puts them on some new shaping exercises and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you. I'm running out of bullet points here, so yeah. we're reaching the end here. But we've had a good discussion. How did Zack find out that Zorian was a looper? Because I, I literally went back and listened to the entire section, and I and I didn't catch it twice. He just shows up one day and punches Zorian. What, what did I miss? I think, like, I think he's had suspicions since Arc 1, because almost the very first, one of the very early loops Zorian did, Zack was just fascinated with him, probably just because Zorian was deviating so much from the norm. True. And I don't think he knew he was a time traveler. He's just like, huh, that's really fucking weird. So he might have been suspicious. I think maybe what it might have been is... Because specifically, Zack confronts Zorian, the loop after Zorian, just like utterly... He, well, I think he just utterly stops the invasion in its tracks completely. Um, and Zack was like, I was, I was fucking planning something for that loop. So I don't know, maybe he was able to tell Zorian was at the head of the anti-invasion. Did he uh, run into him that loop? Is there like a moment where it's like, and then I saw uh, saw Zach during the invasion? I don't think so. I'd have to I'd have to go back. So I'm not crazy. There is no like, ec like direct explanation. You just kind of have to like read between the lines and kind of piece together that Zach figured it out with with a bunch. Of, to be fair, there are a lot of bullet points. I just expected like a dialogue where Zorin goes, "All right, Zach. So tell me how exactly." Or what exactly tipped you off, or what was the breaking point to let you, to letting you know? And like, I don't think that conversation ever popped up. Yeah, you know what? I don't think there. I don't think we actually get an on-screen light bulb moment for Zach, but I kind of wish we did because I feel like it could actually probably be comedic knowing him. Yeah, and and we're so pa far past that where it's like I, I guess we'll never get an explanation. Like, all right. Weird. Okay, so I'm not I, like I felt like I was going crazy. No, I don't think you're crazy. Okay, cool. Um, those are the main things I wanted to bring up. Bradley, what are some of the other other hot topics you wanted to touch on before we wrap up here? No, I was able to get most of mine. I'm just really excited for figuring out what the hell the finale is going to be because Zorian, he experiments with the floating the idea of simulacrums, I think even near the end of this part, mm -hmm. which is so adjacent to the idea of another him outside of this time loop that I, I feel like him playing with 
simulacrums is kind of priming us for like what philosophy is he gonna have when it you know comes time to interact uh, with himself. part three is so much better than the rest because you're gonna I'm get saying. you're gonna get answers to that like next time you listen uh, potentially it's Woo. it's right around the corner where we start really digging our teeth into what that means so that's um, what part three needs is like part three needs to be like I want the philosophical dilemmas. I want the payoffs. I want the big fights. That's what I want. I'm with you, right? If this is a four-part story, I want um, part three to be exactly that. I want it to be the most thematically rich as we, like, know reality now and we get to see Zorian deviating. I want part four to be the hard deviation where Zorian and Zack have to do... have to make the hard decisions, you know? Because um, at this point, I can't... There's been a lot of different settings and towns in this story, and it's... I feel like it's hard to believe that there's going to be a lot more new settings we go to. Like, may maybe one. The only other place I really see us going is the faraway country that Zorian's brother is in, if he finds a way to teleport there or something. But Yeah, um, like we, we have to have a payoff to dad and bro. Like, that that's a given. And I don't know exactly how, but... At, I, at this point, I feel like we have our settings, we have our characters, we have most of our abilities. I, I want to see some Counterpoint. Shit. We've introduced a MacGuffin quest. I feel like part four could be that adventure to get the MacGuffins. Actually, you know what? <laughs> I, I kind of had that exact same thought where I was like, oh, we need these keys. We, it's like we got to find the Horcruxes in Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we will be visiting a couple places, but it, 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 hopefully, honestly, it's not as fleshed out. I kind of want us to focus it on the characters and the action when we get to that point as opposed to the setting. Yeah, like... Cause like, it's not the strength of the book, I don't think. If we see one of the keys, I, I just want them to be like, oh, thank God we found one of the keys instead of hearing the 10-minute explanation of the country that that key came from and why it's important. I, oof, that's viable. And then if it's part five, right, here's what I picture for the end game of the story. I hope it's not Zorian versus Zack, but I could oh, see, like, the, the very last bit before they leave, I could see it being Zorian versus Zack or, like, Zack having to sacrifice himself for Zorian because... Here's the thing, dude. Kirill and Zach... Kirill hasn't died yet, right? Which is shocking. I mean, that's gotta happen at some point. Oh, dude, like, she's too good to not die. It's 1,000% happening. But I think Zach dies for real for Zorian. And man. It's gonna hurt, man. Cause Zach, cause Zach is such a good boy. The way I... If there is a Zach versus Zorian encounter, the way I would imagine it is... Maybe it's after they're already about at their end game and they want yeah. to leave the loop, but maybe they have different ideologies for how they should leave the loop. Because it's one thousand percent that, or they were right where it's only feasible for one of them to leave with the Horcruxes. Because, like, what if it gets to the point that they can both leave, and Zorian has finally gotten himself to a place where, like, his conscience is okay with replacing his original self, but then Zach, being the good boy he is, is like. No, Zorian, you oh. can't do that. I won't let you. Bradley, this sounds so good. Like, there's so, so much potential here. And, and that's not even the only good angle I can think of. No, no, there's like 12 good angles that could take it. So I, I really hope it goes any one of those good angles. And uh, so, and then I, and then I picture a. Now that I have an understanding of what the story is, I picture there being quite a few chapters dedicated to the perfect run. Like you're playing the game Death Loop, where you have to find out. Yes. One, a way to kill all eight targets in the same day using, like, a day-night cycle. I'm expecting, like, a planning section and then an execution of, like, a Jimmy and Kim scheme where they have <laughs> they have to pull off the perfect loop in one month and escape at the end of that. Dude, that's what's crazy. That's the other thing learning about the true nature of the time loop changed is this whole time there's kind of been this idea of, like, if we can figure out how to end the time loop, we can just wait until we have the perfect run and then end it. But in reality, it's like, no, once we leave, then it starts and we have to do it right that time. Or exactly. So, so yeah, there's going to have to be two perfect runs, which is what's yeah. exciting. It's like the one to leave and then the one where there's no, like where you're in the real world and there's no escape. Cause of course, when they get back, there's going to be a final threat. I think granted, you know, and maybe I shouldn't even bring this up, I remember briefly when we first got into the series, when you first talked to me about it, a criticism I remember is that the ending is abrupt, maybe? Ooh, so maybe I, I should set my expectations to not expect an outside arc at all. 
Um, yeah, uh, that's the thing is I'll, you know, I I don't even know how many chapters are going to come after exiting the loop. Exactly. Maybe I should prime myself for just an epilogue or something. But I'm I'm really hoping we're going to get the god stretch. It, it, regardless, you there will be a very cool this is our last chance. And you know what's cool, right? We just have to have that one perfect run. As the story gets more and more complex, that is more things they're going to have to do just right in that last go. That's um, the thing. Like, when exciting. the story started out, a perfect run consisted of just stopping the invasion. Yeah. And then the perfect run consisted of, okay, we got to stop the invasion, but now I have all these people I care about who aren't necessarily in the city who are going to die at the start of the loop. So now the perfect run is stopping the invasion, but also saving them. And then now the perfect loop is doing all of that, but also we have to get all seven keys within a month. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. Like... So that is like an ultimate wrinkle, and we have to befriend all the right people to get, like, oh, this person has an airship we need or something, so we need to, like, optimize befriending him. There's going to be, I don't know, maybe I'm hyping myself up too much for what could be a very straightforward story, because the story has played it pretty straightforward at times, but, like, you, you just feel that there's that potential for, like, a huge uh pickup in pace for that last God. stretch and it's so scary because even if they get to the point where they can perfect run the time loop they don't know what red robe's goal is so whenever they oh leave God. they're gonna be going in blind that is so oh man you know what let's set let's simmer expectations it's gonna yeah, be yeah, an yeah. all right finale <laughs> it's gonna be an all right climax let, let, let's keep it cool yeah, yeah yeah all right that wraps up everything i wanted to bring up same we had I we went a little longer than I expected actually. I was like, you know, I don't have that much to say, but you know what? I just like talking juice. to you, dude. R two like had some juice. It was a good one. Yeah. I like that I can uh, read the story with you. So I need to check and see if three is actually the last, or if there is going to be a four. I would like to know. Actually, I don't want to be yeah. surprised. I'd like to so. set myself. Uh, that's also nice because I stopped reading three and moved on to another book until uh, you caught up. So I'm Probably back at call. it. You know what? I'm, I'm excited to read more after talking. I will say, Arc 3 makes it easy to keep going. It, it's very entertaining. Oh, man. Some good shit coming ahead of you already. But, all right, y'all. If uh, For the one guy out there, hope you enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, tune in next time, buddy. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you stick around. All right, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.